students i am professor manasi patel and here i am in this video taking your favorite chapter chapter 3 general clauses act ma'am we don't like this chapter lot ma'am we are unable to write ma'am we are unable to understand certain sections blah 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 i've heard a lot about this chapter but trust me bachas this chapter is very very manageable it's a very small chapter that you know and secondly it is still gonna get you around 7 to 8 sometimes even 9 marks i'm telling you including mcqs same case with your interpretation of statute it's a small chapter but still gonna get you around 7 8 around 9 marks so if i merge both of these chapters approximately 18 to 20 marks these two chapters are gonna give you and these two chapters are very very small if i compare it with your negotiable instruments act or your indian contract act or even companies act for that matter so please do not leave this an option of course when we do these revision points at that time i'll tell you which sections are more likely to come or which sections are important see you can write the answer in your own words absolutely there is no problem try to put as many legal terms possible that is heavy words law words try to put latin terms wherever possible and try to put the case laws wherever possible so honestly if your examiner does not have time you make your answer so attractive writing those case laws and latin terms and legal terms that he has no choice but to read your answer and give you marks so please make your answer very very attractive especially these two chapters general clauses act and interpretation of statutes normally i tell all my students please do the writing practice just reading is not going to be enough if they ask you explain effect of repeal you should not be like this so you should be writing this at least the important ones which i am going to tell you at least you do the writing practice for that if not all then let's start up with this general clauses act 1897 now as the act the name suggests it's general clauses act basically it's going to tell you about general rules and regulation about other laws this act helps you how to read and interpret other laws basically i can say he is a younger brother of your interpretation of statutes object of interpretation of statutes and general clauses act is the same that is to read and interpret the other laws If I take an example, let's say I was driving a car, I see a red signal. Now I don't have much patience. I just see here and there there is no one around, and nicely I break the signal. Somewhere out of the bushes, who appears? The policeman. The policeman stops me and tells me, "Ma'am, you broke the signal. You are supposed to pay fine." And I, with full attitude, say, "I am not liable to pay fine. I have read the law." He is looking at me. What happened to her? of course you are liable to pay fine i tell him you know in the law it is written if he breaks the signal he will be liable to pay the fine and i'm not he so i'm not liable to pay the fine see here even you it might sound that this argument is very very stupid but boss argument is valid because if you see all the laws everywhere they have used masculine genders that does not mean females are excluded of course females are included we don't want to get excluded also yes we are also included so here they have made a general rule he will include she that means wherever in other laws wherever they have written masculine genders he him it will also include she and her similarly singular will include plural and vice versa so every time writing person slash persons company slash companies you just write company here the section says the singular will also include plural now bachcha this is a general point and this general point about other laws it's given in this act another example let's say my court proceeding is going to happen on a particular day and due to some reason the court is closed on that day so when will my court proceeding take place next to working day simple common sense which is not so common in our country therefore they had to write this as a section that here if your court is closed on that particular day of hearing it will happen on the next working day again it's a general point 
another example there can be distances you know aviation rules speed rules etc and in some law they give you kilometers they give you some distance as in 1000 kilometers 200 kilometers so that 1000 kilometers which they have measured which are they have not measured like this right they have measured horizontally and straight line so this two the difference between this two points is calculated and given that also they have clarified because you cannot assume everyone has brains and everyone uses those brains so they are like it's okay we don't expect much from you you please better read this section that wherever any distance is given it is measured in straight line on horizontal plane again it's a general rule now introduction date of a particular act normally it is given in the act itself for example indian contract act you studied the birthday or the introduction date is 1st of september 1872 by chance if some law does not contain the introduction date then what where will you go then bacha you will take the assent date that is approval date so if you remember indian contract act the assent date was 25th april if they would not have given 1st of september you would have taken 25th april so bacha what am i trying to tell you here these are all general rules and regulations which are given here so the object of this law is two main objects two main objects are there first to shorten the language of other laws everywhere writing he she him her singular plural singular plural it will increase the length of other acts so this act says calm down you just write one gender you just write singular we are telling you one common section that it will include the feminine gender also and it will include the plural also so here it has shortened the language of other laws similarly second object is to give uniformity of expression you know for example o o o o so o can be interpreted in multiple ways right so this act says no 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 please do not use your brains we will tell you the right way how you are supposed to interpret it that means bacha it's gonna give you uniformity of expression that this word is to be interpreted in this way only so that is the object of this act and because of these important objects bacha this act is also known as law of all the laws it is the law of other laws fine but then who thought about this act that we should make such an act there was one i am telling you this there is a reason why i am telling you this bacha there was one lord brogham this dude thought in 1850 that we should make a general law for reading other laws so he started making the act in 1850 finally 1868 the first general clauses act was made general clauses act 1868 the birthday was 3rd jan 1868 of course brogan must be dead by that time but then it was made by others they carry forwarded the legacy okay then some more words were introduced some more changes were made in 1887 the next general clauses act came 1887 the birthday is 14th jan 1887 and finally you are studying the latest one 1897 is latest sadly general clauses act 1897 the birthday is 11th of march 1897 so bacha here yes so why i am telling you the states i am not showing off my historical knowledge there but bacha these dates are relevant in this chapter you have certain sections where these dates are used so that's why i'm telling you okay now this act normally you study that in every act you have the birthday that is here it is 11th march 1897 and secondly bacha you always study where it is applicable whole of india or what which state or which country etc here this does not have any territorial extent it means basically yes this act is not applicable on some particular geographic area this act is applicable on other acts wherever that act is applicable on that general clauses act is also applicable so there is no territorial extent given okay 
Now one more thing I want to tell you before we start on with this chapter. Bacha, who makes laws in our country? Parliament. And when was parliament made? Okay. 1950 parliament was made. Constitution and then. So after 1950, bacha, laws are made by parliament. Right? Parliament. And since laws are made by parliament, which I can also say the assent is given by president of our country. He gives the approval, final approval. Okay, we got independence in 1947. Till then, laws were made by Britishers. Laws were made by Britishers. Now what happens here? Some students tell me ma'am no law is made. Wow, what a convenient answer. Of course laws are made but our own act was made. Your Chartered Accountants Act 1949 was made. Banking Regulation Act 1949 was made. So the laws were definitely made in this period. But the laws were made by Dominion Legislature. Dominion legislature and the assent is given by the governor general Gigi. Ma'am, why did you tell us this? Because this part also will be used some places. Assent is governor general when it comes to Dominion legislature and assent is president when it comes to parliament. Okay, keep this in mind. Now, let me start off with the act. So, yes, you will find this in your textbook. Background and aim of the act, I told you the birthday, 11th March 1897. It does not have any territorial extent. It is applicable wherever that respective law is applicable. I told you object is to shorten the language, provide uniformity of expression, law of all the laws. Now, definitions which are normally you see in section 2. Here you will see in section 3. Ma'am, why? They are wish. Normally, definitions are given in initial sections. There is no hard and fast rule that definition should be given in section 2 only. It's their choice. Now, here first you will apply the definition given in the respective act. If something is not given, then you follow this act's definition. For example, bacha, person is already defined in income tax act then you don't apply this rules. Financial year is already defined in Companies Act. Then you don't follow these definitions. You follow these definitions only if the act does not define that particular word. For example, bacha, month. It's a very general word. Which month? See, according to Hindus, months are different. Bhadrapad, etc. According to Islam, yes, the months are different and so on. So different people, different religions, different rules. Therefore, they are saying no, 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 no. When it comes to month, it cannot be month as per your religion. Here the month has to be as per the Britishers calendar. That means they are talking about Jan, Feb, March, etc. Similarly, year. Year means the normal year which Britishers take. Not the year, annual year which we follow. Because in India, we have different, different new years. Yes, Gujarati New Year is different, Marathi New Year is different, then Tamil New Year is different and so on. So different, different calendars we follow in our country, they are like no, year means Britishers year only. So Bacha, these are general words like month, year, good faith, writing, registered, these are all general words. If you have the specific definitions of these words in your own act, please follow that. If that act does not say anything, please follow this. So see, they are defined in the act. If they are not defined, please take it from General Clauses Act. Means and includes, I have explained this properly in interpretation of statutes, which are two types of definition. Yes, exhaustive and inclusive. If it is exhaustive, company means a company incorporated under Companies Act so and so. That means here, it. this means this exhaustive that is exhaustive definition and includes this includes this 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 debentures include debenture stock etc 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 
so it's an inclusive definition right then shall and may when i use the word you shall do this means it is having a compulsory force you may do this means it's having a optional force mandatory force and this is directory force again this i have explained properly in interpretation of statutes but anyway sometimes you know whenever you write the word may it gives you some absurd meaning so here you will consider this as shall company may be formed for lawful purpose yes it doesn't make sense you are not giving a choice to company that either you form for lawful or unlawful purpose therefore your may will be treated as shall another example you will see here itself in the act itself the act may be called as general clauses act what is this may be called as what are you going to call it indian contract act you are going to call it negotiable instruments act no na you don't have a choice bachcha this act should be called as general clauses act only so your may will be treated as shall okay now definitions i'm going to take up important definitions affidavit is an important definition so there are three terms which you need to know bachcha there is something known as affidavit affidavit there is something known as oath and there is something known as swear now if you just pass by any court you will find at least two three lawyers running behind you and asking you you need affidavit 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 now have you ever heard the term affidavit yes it's basically a formation or a written declaration so normally if i want to declare something i will write it here and then i will say this information is true and best to my knowledge and then i will put the signature this is treated as evidence in the court for example if i am writing a declaration that i manasi patel stay at so and so premises with following people first one so and so husband second one so and so son etc etc so when i write this basically i am saying that this is true whatever i have given the declaration and this can be treated as evidence later on if they come to know this is not true of course there will be penalty i'll be punished etc etc so affidavit is written declaration or affirmation oath you might have heard the term oath pledge pledging that you are taking the oath that in this case whatever i am saying is right etc see oath is some uh, chief ministers prime ministers presidents they take this oath whether they follow whatever they have said or not that's a different matter but oath is also taken in the court i swear i swear yeah, i swear but here you don't swear in the name of your mother you don't swear in the name of your crush or your girlfriend but bachcha in law you swear in the name of god they say like this i swear in the name of god that whatever i am going to say that's going to be true see whether you believe in god or not that's a different matter we are not considering that at all we are not even concerned swear means swear should be in the name of god so that is your affidavit oath and swear you'll find this definition affidavit is affirmation and declaration and see it's a written statement confirmed by oath and uh, i think next to next page you will find oath affirmation declaration instead of swearing and next page you will find swear swear with its grammatical variation and cognate expressions means whatever grammar you use i swear or i am taking this particular pledge whatever grammar you use you are affirming and declaring something but in all three cases i told you the meaning eventually they have to write a note that all three words are same then why did they define it in three ways if they are same so what they are trying to tell you is the conclusion of all three is same whenever you write affidavit oath or swear what is your intention your intention is to tell people ki listen i am telling you true i am not lying whatever statement i have told you that is truth okay now coming back to my affidavit after affidavit the important definition is document it is important from exam point of view 
I have already explained document in interpretation of statutes properly. Yes, there, there were four terms, matter, means, then your substance, your record, etc. So any matter, whatever you write on the substance that is paper or any rock or anything, yes, by means of letters, figures, etc. for the purpose of recording that matter. That record is by which you write. You please watch the interpretation of statutes video which I have explained that in depth there because there they had expanded it. So it is same as your interpretation of statutes. Okay. Then financial year this is important. I know it's simple but it's still important from exam point of view. Charters what is financial year? 1st April to 31st March? No. 1st day of April to last day of March whatever what is calendar year first day of jan to last day of december and they have given you the difference also between both good faith is also important Fa yes thing will be termed to be deemed to be done in good faith if it is done honestly whether negligently or not but you have studied good faith in negotiable instruments act hidc person who obtains the instrument for consideration in good faith. Good faith means innocently, honestly you take it, whether negligently or not. You have also studied good faith in sale of goods act and CPT or CA foundation if you remember. Yes, Nemo that cord non-habit, the bona fide buyer will get a good title even if the sale is done by non-owners. And bona fide means good faith. So even if the buyer is taking this in good faith, that is innocently, he will get a good title. So anything which is done honestly, whether negligently or not. But Bacha, if a particular act defines good faith, please follow that. Otherwise you follow this. Now, immovable property is again important. They have asked several questions on this. It's very simple but important. Immovable property will obviously include land. Land is immovable property. Benefits arising out of land. Trees. But I won't say just trees. I will use the term standing trees. Which are standing trees is immovable asset. Standing crops is immovable asset. Once you cut them, then they become goods and then they become movable. But if I am selling you a piece of land along with 10 trees on it, I have not chopped them. So I will say legally I have sold you immovable property. If I am selling you the land and I chop the trees and I am selling you the timber as well. So I am selling you immovable as well as movable property. So benefits arising out of land, things attached to earth, buildings, bungalows, etc. Permanently fastened to earth, roads, mines, etc. So this is your immovable property. And along with immovable property, Bacha, you also have movable property on the same page. Anything which is not movable. Anything which is immovable. That is movable. Super. Good for us. Simple thing to remember. Then the next, as I told you, month is according to British's calendar. Then next important definition is person. Person will include any company or association or body of individuals. And then writing. Writing will include lithography, photography or any other mode by presenting, representing or reproducing the words in visible form. Which I say something in my mind. It is not in writing. The moment I write it, it's writing. So I am producing the words in a visible form. I write something, click a picture, it is photography. It's still considered as writing. Or let's say I'm putting a stamp. I'm not talking about the revenue stamp, the stamp, you know, the, where the words are written. So if I put a stamp, it's still considered as writing. And lastly, Bicha, ear means British's ear. Now, coming to general rules of construction which are section 5. I had already discussed this, Pacha. If the introduction date is already given in the act, you will follow that date. If that date is not given, then you will follow the assent date. 
if it is governor general then assent from governor general dominion legislature or president if it's an act of parliament important from exam point of view effect of repeal first you understand what do you mean by the word repeal repeal means gone poof it never existed repeal in simple words means cancelling the law for example which are companies act 1956 is repealed it's repealed of course now it is reenacted as companies act 2013 but the point is it has been repealed so companies act 1956 let's say mansi was appointed as managing director of this company and in that case she is getting the remuneration also as a managing director under this act now this act is gone does that mean mansi has to resign obviously no right does that mean she will stop getting the remuneration no so bachcha this act repeals it will not affect any management or appointments or remuneration similarly some judgment is passed under this act if the act is gone that does not mean the judgment will get reversed right suppose some judge has given a judgment that you are hereby sent to jail for 14 years so just because this act is gone that does not mean he will come out of the jail so it will not affect any inquiry litigation punishment penalties or forfeitures it is basically not going to bring back anything it is not going to affect anything ha huh. the new things will not happen as per this act because this act no longer exists but if any old things which have happened as per this act it will not be affected so see the repeal will not revive anything affect any prior management affect any claim privilege or responsibility or debt affect any punishment forfeiture or penalty or inquiry litigation anything basically conclusion is repeal will not affect anything it will not affect anything simple now one very crucial thing which i want to tell you bachcha there is a difference between deletion and repeal when i say some law is deleted when i say some law is deleted it is deleted from that xyz date but when i say some law is repealed the object of repeal is to obliterate the act from the books that means it never existed so deletion suppose if the law is deleted on 20th march then from this date itself it is gone but when i say some law is repeal you have to assume it never existed now i'm going to tell you one stupid example but still it will help you understand example let's say there is one miss x she had a friend miss y and they had a huge fight and they had a fight on 20th august 2020 and they stopped talking to each other after that so they were friends till this date but after that they stopped talking right so let's say miss x is wife of mr x and they are having a very bad marriage he beats her etc etc so they file for divorce and when they file for divorce you know what people tell miss x you assume that he never existed in your life it was a bad chapter just forget about him you assume he never existed so this is bachcha repeal and this is deletion so repeal it never existed deletion means it existed till that particular date okay so object is to obliterate it is different from repeal i mean deletion is different from repeal and so on see all these case laws you don't have this in your syllabus that what happened in the case law you just have the final judgments now if a law is repealed and revived that means companies act 1956 it was gone and you brought it back as companies act 2030 so people wants to know what time pass is going on why did you just repeal it and bring it back why did you do this 
so you need to expressly state the purpose to the public that why you are reviving it back and if an act is repealed and reenacted with or without modification it will be considered as a new act so companies act 1956 is repealed and it was brought back with modification as companies act 2013 so that company is act 2013 will be considered as a new act now section 9 is very simple but it is important from exam point of view so for example if dividend is declared on 30th september see i am deliberately taking the same example given in the textbook so if dividend is declared on 30th september 2016 you have to pay the dividend within 30 days right so if you add 30 days it will be 30th october it won't be 31st october but so it's not one month it's 30 days so when you calculated 30 days this date will be excluded your calculation will start from 1st october and it will end on 30th october so this is what is given so this will exclude the first day and include the last day and as i already told you if the court or office is closed you will just yes it will be conducted on the next day whenever it is open this also you know measurement of distances straight line horizontal plane then proportionately suppose excise duty or some act it is mentioned 1 kg is equal to 1000 rupees the duty so obviously 1000 kg will be how much it will be 10 lakhs so you calculated this proportionately that's what they are saying so the rate is same the rate is 1000 rupees per kg so the duty leviable will be same rate on any gender or less quantity so proportionately you will calculate and the rate will be same for male or female any gender this i already discussed important from exam point of view which i at least try to remember these section numbers which i have marked as important so masculine will include feminine and singular will include plural and vice versa now section 14 is very very simple which i let's say government has given power to income tax department to appoint income tax officers and income tax inspector are they going to appoint them every day no na only when the from time to time when the occasion requires yes power to appoint will also include power to appoint ex officio that i'll tell you in 2 minutes time but first i will tell you this but if you have a power to appoint someone you have an implied power to kick that person out that means you have an implied power to suspend or dismiss that person right now coming to ex officio i have seen this whenever i ask my students what is ex officio they tell me ex officer all exes are not those exes so please don't think that ways but ja ex officio is a latin term it means you get one post by virtue of another post you hold now if you read like this it will go bouncer 100% so i am going to take up one example actual example so in your unit 8 of your companies act you have done iepf investor education and protection fund i'm sure you remember this okay there you have iepf authority who is going to manage that iepf fund etc so you had chairperson then you had vice chairperson then you had other members okay i'm not writing that in depth i need just chairperson and in your books itself it was given this chairperson is secretary of mca ministry of corporate affairs appointed ex officio that means any person who is a secretary of ministry of corporate affairs will automatically become the chairperson of iepf authority so he is getting this post because of this post he holds this is known as ex officio so if manasi that is me if i am a secretary of ministry of corporate affairs 
I automatically become a chairperson of IPF authority. So I'm a secretary of MCA. I automatically become a chairperson of IPF. I'm getting this post because of this. Now, but I use common sense. Any person who has a power to appoint secretary of MCA, can I say he has an implied power to appoint chairperson of IPF? Exactly. That's what they have given. Power to appoint will also include power to appoint ex officio. Fine. Then, suppose there is some document which is to be signed by the chairman. And let's say chairman is not there for a couple of days. I am the vice chairman there. So, I can also sign. But, Bacha, if I am signing, can I say I need to mention that I am a vice chairman? Otherwise, people will feel I am the chairman. So, here, if you are replacing someone, you need to mention your official title. So, I will have to mention that I am vice chairman. One more thing I want to ask you. Since I am signing in the place of chairman, can I say whatever rules were applicable to the chairman, the same rules will be applicable to me? Yes, because I am replacing him. So, that is your section 19. Section 19. Any law which is applicable to chief or superior will also apply to deputies and subordinates who are performing the duties in place of that superior. Successor is very simple. Boss, they are just telling you one simple thing. If you want your organization or if you want any corporation to have a perpetual succession, please mention the law of successors. You know company is having a perpetual succession. Even one person company has a perpetual succession. That means that sole member, one person of that company dies. Still the company will go on and his nominee will become the shareholder and the director, right? But sir, you are so confident about this because companies act has clearly mentioned what will happen if that sole member dies. That's what I'm telling you. If you want something to continue forever, you only mention what should be the law of successors. Please mention the law of successors. Then, provisions as to orders, rules, etc. made under enactments, that is, acts or laws. Now, Bacha, as I told you, yes, before these are very, very simple rules, even this is very simple. Bacha, you have done Companies Act 2013, right? And you also have Companies Rules. You also have Forms of Companies Act, right? Now, Companies Act 2013 has defined private company. Can I say this definition will be same in the rules as well and the forms as well, right? So, any expression used in notification etc. will have the same meaning given in the act. And any person who is having a power to make rules or issue notification, he also has an implied power to change those rules or cancel those rules. So, it's like your power to appoint will also include power to suspend or dismiss. A similar logic here. Power to make rules will also include power to change those rules or cancel those rules. Here students get confused. Yes, making of rules or bylaws and issuing orders between passing and commencement. I'll tell you example. Indian Contract Act 1872. Bacha, the ascent date. The ascent date is 25th of April 1872. And the birthday that is introduction date is 1st of September 1872. Okay. That means there is some gap between these two dates. That means around 4-5 months gap. Now in this period, Bacha, see law is final here. But it is actually introduced to the public here. In this period, if any notification or amendments or any bylaws are made related to this act, can I say they will get effect only after this date? Yeah, that's what they have given. They will not take effect till the commencement. This is important from exam point of view, section 23. Which are wherever I have marked important, please, please at least do writing practice of that. So, section 23 tells you how to make the rules or bylaws. Which are how to make those rules. See, first you will make a draft. 
of those rules. It's a draft. It's a rough way. Then you will be publishing that draft. Ma'am, how? Whatever government tells you, that way you publish. Or you publish it in your own way. You can put it on some website. You can publish it. Whatever. So make a draft. Publish that draft. Give a notice that you have published the draft. And then you invite objections and suggestions. That anyone has any problem, anyone has any suggestion, please let us know. Some person comes and says, yes, I have a problem. The authority is like, yes, what is your problem? He says, I don't like the rules. Please remove them. Authority is like, are you mad? Obviously, they will not consider such cartoon suggestion, right? He will be told to get lost. Let's say some other person comes and says, I have a genuine problem. If you do this, it will affect this, this, this. So he is giving a proper justification. Then the authority might feel, okay, I should consider this. That means, Bacha, what I am trying to tell you is, just because you invite suggestion, that does not mean you have to consider everyone's suggestion and objections. You consider only those suggestions which you feel are fine. After you consider those objections and suggestions, make the final law and publish it in the official gazette. Once you publish it in the official gazette, it is deemed to be done. So once again, make the draft, publish the draft, give a notice that you have published it, invite objections, suggestions and after that you make the final rules and publish it in the official gazette. See here. Make the rules, the draft, publish it, notice, objection, suggestions, publish it in the official gazette. Miscellaneous section 25 is very simple. It tells you about recovery of fines. The Companies Act, SEBI Act have imposed huge penalties on people like 25 crores, 30 crores, 2 crores. The person is like, it's okay you impose it on me, but I don't have that money. Do whatever you want, get lost. See, government will not let that person go, right? The court will not let that person go. So, they will have their own procedure to recover the fines. That means you will be arresting that person. You will be selling off his assets. Ma'am, assets are not there. Then he will be sent to jail. Ma'am, apart from that, how will you recover? See, you can't sell his kidney, right? And recover your fine. But they have their own process. So, section 63 to 70 of Indian Penal Code and some rules of criminal procedure code will tell you what is that process. So here they are saying we are not using our brains. We are going to follow these two acts only. Okay. Then if any offense is there under two or more acts, the person will be prosecuted and punished only once. A chartered accountant, if he does any fraud, this is considered as an offense in Chartered Accountants Act as well as your company's act. But he will not be punished twice, Bacha. He will be punished only once under either of them. So see, he'll be prosecuted or punished under either, not twice. Service by post, important, very simple, but very important. So, so many times, you know, you have been reading this in different other laws also that serve it by post, like for example, Indian Contract Act, you have to communicate the offer by post. Then Negotiable Instruments Act, send the notice by post. Or your Companies Act, send it by post. What is this post? Whenever any act tells you to send something by post, you have to fulfill three conditions. Write proper address. Wow. Prepay. That means you have to pay. The receiver should not be paying. You, that is the sender has to pay. And you have to post it by registered post. You fulfill three conditions, your work is done. So you have done the proper service by post. He doesn't get it. He doesn't like it. That is his problem. Proper address, prepaying it, registered post, that's it. Your work is done. For example, I wrote proper address. I prepaid it and I send it by registered post. But the opposite person was not in the house. He did not get the notice. Is it my problem? No. It is his problem. I am done by doing these three things. Similarly, I sent proper address, prepaid, registered post. 
but that person did not like my notice so on that notice he wrote refused still the notice or it is deemed to be sent properly he did not like it it is his problem right but one thing is there bacha you will follow this only if some act does not tell you to follow another method for example if there is some law which tells you that you have to send it by post acknowledgement due send it by registered post acknowledgement due it means you have to send it by registered post only but you don't have to pay the opposite person has to pay that means it should not be prepaid it will be postpaid that the opposite person will pay some act is telling you to follow this then please follow that don't follow this so if you do this you can't take the protection of saying that are i followed general clauses act so it's right no it's not so this you will follow only if your own act does not tell you to follow anything citation means giving reference for example this is your company's act 2013 and in some point bacha they have put some star or number and here they have written a star number and they write section 202 of sebi act so basically they are quoting a source this is known as citation see the whole sebi act will not come here only section 202 of sebi act will come here so this is known as citation giving a reference telling the source so citation can happen not only for the sections citation can happen also for the case laws i don't know if you have read this a versus b sc 2002 aiir 28 now what is this aiir is all india reporters journal so this book this page number you will find this case law judgment is given by supreme court in the year 2002 so when you write this na basically bacha you are quoting the case law you are also telling the source it is known as citation so citation saving for previous laws they are just telling you one simple thing whenever the acts keep on getting amended the old things get saved so companies act 2013 every year it gets amended so the old rules get saved unless you have changed some rule or unless you have removed some rule if nothing is given they will get saved and lastly it's also applicable to ordinances i hope i am very very clear please do the writing practice try to put lot of legal terms and if you are not in a position to write everything in legal language that's absolutely okay but definitions you please try to put it in this language only otherwise other explanation you can write it in your own words yes bye bye everyone